We have an amazing marketer and more important leader. Um, please help me welcome to the stage the former CMO of Toys R Us when it was doing good and the founder of Shadow Brand, uh, Branding Group. Sorry, I gotta get this right. Shadow Branding Group, Warren Cornbrum. Let's give a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I don't know that I can have that level of energy, but I'll try and uh, guide you through a little bit of thought for the next uh, half hour or so. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for having me here. It's great. Um, I will say that it's a little bit uh, emotional still for me as uh, one of the first generation Toys R Us kids to talk about Toys R Us and to talk about it when it's not around anymore. But I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that experience. Um, and I'm going to take you through sort of a little bit of the history of the company and most importantly, not talk about Toys R Us specifically, but talk about Toys R Us in the context of how we look at brands, how we counsel brands, how we advise brands to go forward, and how we respect, most of all, the consumers. Because at the end of the day, there are no brands if there aren't consumers. So, you know, Toys R Us, when I was there, and I'll talk a little bit about what, what it was, there was a, it was a $12 billion company. It was in 27 countries around the world. It was by far the biggest toy retailer. And there absolutely, from the board on down through management, was an opinion or a, or a belief or a confidence that we were, like a lot of the companies we have read about in the last few years, that we were too big to fail. That all the competition that was coming was going to go away, that it could never over, you know, never catch up to the distribution, the supply chain, all that stuff that Toys R Us had. Well, the premise of what I want to talk to you about today is that that doesn't work. It doesn't work at all, and there's plenty of examples. You are never too big to fail in today's changing world. When people and marketers forget what they're doing and lose sight of their consumer, they're going to fail. When you refuse to accept change, which we certainly did, you're going to fail. Technology. Even to the day it closed, Toys R Us's website in a world where e-commerce is so very important was awful. The store experience was awful. The e-commerce experience was just about as bad in a virtual way. If you always assume that your heritage is going to guide you toward your future, that because you were number one for 50 years, you're going to remain number one forever, you're going to fail. If you fall in love with who you are and not your consumer, you're going to fail. And I think at the end of the day, it goes down to leadership. And when leadership believes arrogantly that all they have to do is open the doors, they're going to fail. Toys R Us, in my mind, should not have failed. Toys R Us had almost a unique purpose with kids and their families. Even today, when people, and I've been gone from Toys R Us for more than a decade, but even today, when people come up to me and want to talk about Toys R Us, there's a sadness. There's like an emotional attachment that says, I just wish Toys R Us was around. And I know there's all kinds of stories about the lenders may bring it back. And I hope that people will bring Toys R Us back, but not, it's not going to be the lenders who make it. Marketing people, brand people, people who respect the consumer are the ones who are going to need to bring that brand back. But the, the emotional attachment that people had was never about how good Toys R Us was doing things in the last 15 years. It was more about the generation of Toys R Us kids, the first generation of Toys R Us kids were the parents of today. So there was almost this affinity that you wanted it to be good. When people come up to me now and say, it's so sad when I go to Times Square, it's not about they had this great experience, it's about the magic of what that brand had and what it stood for and what it should have been. But Toys R Us completely lost sight of its consumer. It focused absolutely inward versus embracing change. I remember meetings where it was always about cubic foot storage and shrink and are people going to steal our products? What's going to happen? It was immersed in operational efficiency rather than focusing on the most important people of all, those little three feet to four feet to five feet kids and all of us who love those kids and want to give them that special toy. One of the things that we used to always talk about Think about Christmas time or gift giving or a birthday. Whether you're the mother, the father, the uncle, the aunt, you always want to be the one who gives that toy 
that the child's eyes light up. And it's not always the most expensive one, it's just the right one for that child. And Toys R Us should have been the company that you had a better shot at being that um, favorite uncle, favorite aunt, whatever. Um, inconsistent leadership. Well, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the, of the history of the company very quickly. But one of the things that was there, I was just saying backstage, in my five years at Toys R Us, which were from 1999 to 2005 when it switched to private equity, there were three CEOs. I don't care what company you're talking about, that's just too inconsistent leadership. Toys R Us absolutely was arrogant, and when Amazon in particular started selling toys, thought, eh, never happened. People are going to want to roll them around on the floor, they're going to want to touch them, they're going to want to put batteries in them, they're going to want to see what happens. Well, we all know what happened there. Walmart was never going to be a successful toy retailer. We all know what happened there. There was an arrogance that said, we don't have to worry about these people because we are Toys R Us. And there are a lot of companies out there today that are going through severe challenges because they don't take their competition seriously. And I think that's a really important message that we all need to learn because at the end of the day, it's not about your operational efficiency, it's about whether your consumer thinks you are the best place to shop. And Toys R Us lost that. It was not consumer-centered. It was all about stocking, buying, finance, printing things like the big book, not thinking about it from a consumer perspective and making it friendly and exciting with all the things that you guys and the technology you can bring to bear in terms of just our entire communication mechanism with the consumer. It was not focused on them, it was focused on getting it out. Deadlines, filling pages, as opposed to what are people going to want to see. It didn't, it, as I said earlier, did not embrace the internet. I mean, people clearly were looking and are looking to shop in the way they want to shop, where they want to shop, and how they want to shop. Toys R Us did an awful job right up until the day it closed of embracing e-commerce and omni-channel shopping. Toys R Us should not have failed, but it did. And now, what are the lessons that we can learn from it? Just quickly, Toys R Us journey, a lot of people don't realize the first Toys R Us store opened in 1957 by a man named Charles Lazarus who founded it. And ironically, you know, we always hear stories about, sad stories about, I remember my dad was ill and uh, I was living out of town and I wound up coming to see him and he finally let go. Charles Lazarus died within one week of them liquidating Toys R Us. He had a full life, he was in his 90s, but you all, you know, I think, think that brand was his child. Um, and I think also, when you think about the, the brilliance of the original Toys R Us concept, which is why it should not have failed, it should have been respected, it arguably was one of the first disruptors. We didn't call it disruptors then, but toy stores were little mom and pop stores, typically in malls, and Charles' brilliance was, he said, I want to have everything that is a toy. I want to have more of it. I want to have it at the best prices. I want it to be the consummate destination. I want to aggressively advertise. It was an original disruptor of the toy industry. A little bit more of the toy uh, the journey. In 1969, Jeffrey the Giraffe appeared for the first time. Today, if you read the newspapers and the press in the last couple of weeks, they were going to auction the intellectual property for Toys R Us. Jeffrey is still one of the most loved icons around. He lived it from 1969. Toys R Us went public in 1978 on the New York Stock Exchange, and Mr. Lazarus was, I was written up in those days as one of the wealthiest entrepreneurs in America. It was for many years. But that also set off a pattern that wound up with constant leadership change. And in the 20 years after Charles stepped aside, there were almost nine different CEOs. Toys R Us opened Babies R Us in 96, and for the first time, one year before I joined the company, in 1998, Walmart surpassed Toys R Us as the number one seller of toys in America. Something that the board, management, never thought could happen. And it wasn't just the power of Walmart. It was the lack of affinity and the growing disrespect that that brand had for its consumers. Amazon began to increase their presence in the toy category, and a small company that many of you probably don't remember called eToys appeared that was brilliant marketing. It was also a disruptor. It was an internet online only company. 
Atoys, with brilliant marketing, actually was doing $50 million a year in the Christmas, of, uh, Christmas season of uh, 1998. 50 million, 5-0, against Toys R Us's 12 billion in annual sales, and the market cap for eToys that year was greater than Toys R Us's, which showed what a little bit of the, uh, the coming of the internet business, but also lack of confidence in Toys R Us and its ability to move forward. My Toys R Us journey started right after that. I was recruited by the board to be the first CMO of the company. They had, had VPs of marketing, but never a CMO. Um, they were concerned about eToys, they were concerned about Walmart passing Toys R Us, and they knew that we needed to be a much more consumer-centric company, so they found an advertising guy, because I come out of the agency business, and when, in, when I joined, after that first year, our earnings for the holiday season were $276 million. Not good on $12 billion, but $276 million is better than liquidating. In 2001, we opened what I affectionately refer to as my baby, and I hope many of you had the experience of visiting the Times Square store. We didn't open it because it would ever make money. We opened it because we needed to make a statement that Toys R Us was about kids, families, the magic of toys, the magic of learning, the magic of all the things that our brand should do. So that happened in 2001, and uh, for many years thereafter, Toys R Us, for five years in a row, was Toys R Us Times Square was the number one family attraction in Manhattan. We did it right, but we also knew it wouldn't make money. That was never the purpose of it. In 2005, Bain Capital, KKR, and Granado bought Toys R Us in a leveraged buyout, and uh, myself and several other people decided it was time to move on. My first days at Toys R Us were kind of funny. I remember the first meeting I ever went to, I was on the executive committee, and I remember walking in to the boardroom with my new colleagues. And here I was as a marketer who always has tried to focus on my consumer. And my consumer was clear. It was mom with kids. That was the primary focus of everything we did. And here was a room filled with guys with ties who were accountants, supply chain people, there was not another marketing person in that room. There wasn't a woman in the room. That said to me, we've got to think of, you know, we have to look at how we're going to go forward and how we actually can get into our consumer's mind. Stores were in and were efficiently based, efficiency based, in that they were, you know, well run, shrink wasn't a big thing, they weren't getting a lot of people stealing things from them, but they also were probably the worst experience if you were going to bring your kids somewhere. They didn't have diaper stations in the bathrooms. Little, you know, one and one makes two things. Power wheel toys, do you remember those things the kids run around on? Ben from Momentum, I remember this and it's probably why I'm here today. But I remember the first time I walked into a store, those little wagons that kids are supposed to get excited rolling around on were at five feet high with signs that said, don't touch the wagons. Makes no sense. It was not consumer friendly. Bicycles also wrapped vertically in the air. If you said to someone, I want to take my, can my kid see the bicycle? The, the, uh, the sales associate would probably get in trouble if a manager saw him taking something off a rack. It wasn't about the consumer, it was about efficiency. It was about cubic feet of storage. It was about a disengaged and ill-trained staff. If you believe that a toy store should be about the magic of childhood, then you need to staff that store with people who love kids and families and toys. Sometimes I think that some of the best ideas are sitting right in front of us. And, you know, I looked at how do we revitalize this brand? What do we have going for us? And again, it's almost like walking into that boardroom with all the guys with ties. I was looking and I said, well, you know, I was a Toys R Us kid. Jeffrey the Giraffe, everybody loves Jeffrey. What are, where are we doing it? And my marketing folks said, we're not using Jeffrey anymore. He's kind of old and dated. As a two-dimensional cartoon character, he probably was old and dated. But that doesn't mean you don't use them. You take it and you take, and you take advantage of those assets. The classic jingle, I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid. Gone, wasn't being used. Agencies were tired. They were being beat up by non-marketing decisions that were being made. The brand team were trying to hold on to their jobs. And marketing absolutely needed to have a seat at the boardroom table. And I tell you that most of the next five years I fought for that and fought hard. We brought Jeffrey back, I'll show you a little bit about that, some of you may remember the commercials. 
We didn't redo the jingle, we brought it back because the moms of that generation were the first generation of Toys R Us kids and I wanted them to feel that emotional connection. And we redid all of our ad agencies. Little walk through the memory lane. This was the first Jeffrey. Two-dimensional caricature, but loved by people. Then he evolved over 10 years to a little bit friendlier, a little bit still cartoony, but a little bit more, you know, a little inviting, come on in. Then, 10 more years. I don't know, he got a little taller, I guess, but still sort of evolving. And you know, for those of you, a, a lot of you in the print business, you think about two-dimensional graphics, that was sort of, you know, they were evolving it with what they had at those, in those days. Then, when we got there, one is, as we said, let's revitalize the R, let's signal change, let's make Jeffrey a little bit more inviting and friendly and like someone you'd like to have over with your kids. And then eventually, Toward the end, we went to a, the late, great Stan Winston, who was one of the great three-dimensional um, designers in Hollywood. And for the first time, we created Jeffrey as a walking, talking spokes draft, if you will. Um, and that was very successful. The campaign, actually, that we did in those years was uh, rated as the number one in likability by USA Today for three years in a row. Not my genius, it was bringing back people what they liked. We didn't win Clio Awards, we won likability awards. We needed to be about what I call share of heart. You know, as marketing people, we spend a lot of our time talking about share of mind, which is important because we need people to think about us. We spend time talking about top of mind, because if they're not only thinking about us, but they're thinking about us first, we have a better shot at doing business with them. But my premise has always been, if we can get all of that, but we can get them to also like us, hit us in the heart, have a connection with the brand, then it all of a sudden becomes something that's not easily attacked by your competition. We had that, we had the magic of being a toy store. What we sold was something that made kids happy. How much more of an emotional connection or opportunity would you have? About the joy of giving a child that perfect gift I talked about earlier. Everybody wants to be the one that when that package gets unwrapped, it's the one that they play with. And it's, as I said earlier, it's not the most expensive always. It's not the highly most technological. It's just the one they like. Sometimes it's not even something that comes from a toy manufacturer. Learning, educational toys about innovation and discovery. We needed to be a place where parents felt comfortable taking their children and feeling that they were gonna help them. Um, you know, just enjoy their childhood and their growth. Um, we needed to think about exclusives, like the big toy book that a lot of you in this room probably helped us print. It was the definitive book on toy giving for the holiday season. Again, not a money maker, but something that needed to be a leadership role for everything that was wonderful about toys. We needed to start getting expertise in our stores. We needed to have store associates, most of all, who liked being in the toy business and, very challenging in those days, who liked being in retail. What better way to signal the change than going out and building what I hope many of you did get the chance to visit, the greatest toy store in the world, our Times Square flagship with an 80-foot high Ferris wheel, with a 27-foot high Jurassic Park dinosaur, with everything there was to do about being a wonderful kid. Having Mattel, Hasbro, Jack Pacific, MGA, all the companies come in and display their toys in better ways than we could. It really was a wonder. We needed to let consumers know that things were different at Toys R Us. And we were able to, I think, start on that journey. But then what happened was, Unfortunately, and I don't know how many people in this room have private equity ownership, but unfortunately it didn't become about experience anymore. It didn't become about putting a little bit more in to build that relationship with mom and her kids and the extended family. It got right back to all the things that were, were tough. So in 05, uh, we went from publicly traded to private equity. In 9, 2009, bought all the competition. I was gone by then. That they basically bought every other brand in the toy business of consequence. In 15, my baby was shuttered. I still have a hard time walking through Times Square. Not because I'm, you know, a sonic or something like that, just because I just remember all those kids and how happy they were in that store. And it just bothers me that it's not there anymore. Um, in 17, the company started to put itself up for sale. 
from, from, from being, it wasn't about uh, being KKR and Granado, it wasn't about liquidating, but it was how do we get rid of this $5 billion in long-term debt, and then this year, Toys R Us went away for good. So, lessons learned. Thank you for letting me take you through a little bit of that history, but what does it, what does it mean? How does that help? How can I share whatever I can with you guys from the lessons I learned from that stage? And disruption for me is something that is a challenge. It gives me energy as a marketing person. It gives me energy as a branding person. You know, at Toys R Us, it was eToys, and it was Amazon, and it was Walmart. At Rooms to Go, where it was my, my next stop in my career, it was Amazon, Wayfair, and the online people started to change the furniture business. And now that I'm working with a company, work with a company called Sim and Serta, it's about Casper, it's about Tough the Needle, it's about Purple. What is it that allows that to happen? Yes, there's great marketing people. Yes, there's venture capital money that outspends sometimes the legacy brands. But what it really is that allows for disruption is the consumer is saying, I want a better way. Not in those words, but in their actions. They are open to new ways of buying because they don't like what's in front of them. And legacy brands need to adjust to that. Consumers need to know that they're at the focus, that they're at the, the, the part of everything you do. Efficiency is important, and a lot of big companies strive to do it. Toys R Us certainly did. But effectiveness and drawing a relationship with your consumer is more important than an efficiency. Both of them together are a really strong and powerful combination. Broad knowledge, yeah, it's important to know more than anybody else. Data is absolutely fundamental to making good decisions. But at the end of the day, you need to get it right down to that consumer you're trying to appeal to, so individual appeal. And one of the things I often get in trouble when I'm talking to uh, data scientists is when I say research is a valuable tool, but it's never an absolute substitute for sound judgment. You want to know what's going on, you want to be able to measure what's going on, you want to be able to test and learn, but at the end of the day, you also need to say, based on everything I know, this is the direction I'm going to head in, and it's got to have that consumer focus. Great brands of today and tomorrow, in my mind, will understand a few things. They'll understand the enticing power of being empathetic with their consumer. What does that mean? It means that we have lives. We have lots of different influences on those lives. We have lots of different opportunities. And we have lots of challenges. Lots of things go on that affect us as human beings. Great brands are able to draw an affinity. You know, I can't solve the problems, but showing that you're, you're empathetic to them, I think, is a huge thing. Authentic, not changing all the time. Really driving to be the authentic uh, brand within the, character, the, the competitive category that you're in. Critical. Having a sense of community, ample research is showing out there that great brands who care about the communities they're in and who give back are very important. And a sense of community amongst consumers is also important, allowing them to talk to each other, not driving reviews off the charts so that they can't see it, realizing that the good is the good and the bad can be good too if you figure out how to solve it. Transparency. Consumers are constantly telling us today, don't lie to me. Don't mislead me, just tell me what it's like. And whether I like it or I don't like it, I'm gonna respect you as a brand, much like we do as human beings, if you're transparent with me and fair and honest. Emotional connection, share a heart, I talk to you about it. I think when brands achieve share a heart, they win. It's how you communicate, it's how you deal with people, it's how you look after them, and it's also clearly how you look after issues when there are some. Today's brands that are great are going to know that the consumer values time as much as we do anything else. Think about it. When you go through a process of having to make a purchase and it's tedious and you have to go to a lot of places and you're getting confusing information, you walk away from it. When I look at the mattress business, what are Casper doing? It's illogical to say that one mattress will solve the sleep needs of everybody in this room. It's illogical to say that an $850 mattress is as good as a $2,000 Tempur-Pedic or a $3,000 mattress. It doesn't make sense. But what, it, what does make sense is time is important. I don't want to think about all these things. And you know what? If I don't like it, I can give it back. That's the kind of thing we have to deal with today. 
So now I want to change as I draw sort of toward the end of it. So I think a lot about what challenger brands are. And I think big brands, established brands, need to have a challenger mentality. A challenger mentality says I'm not going to just settle for all the things that I think were the demise of my I am going to be a big brand and act like a challenger. And if I'm a disruptor, if I'm a new idea, if I'm a startup, I'm going to act like a challenger. But when you look at them, there are certain things that have been attributes that I think challenger brands bring to the forefront that make them successful. One, embrace intelligent naivety. Constantly challenge. Don't think you know it all. Despite the experience, despite the history, realize that things might be changing and don't feel you have all the answers. Embrace naivety. People who walk in and say, why do we do it the way we're doing it? If you don't have an answer, it shouldn't be just because we do. It should be, you should embrace that person and say, really important that we're thinking about it constantly. Challenge your brands, build a lighthouse of identity. Some people call it a North Star. What is it that we're trying to do? A very clear understanding and an ability to articulate what we stand for, what that lighthouse identity is, and obviously an understanding and a belief and a confidence that that North Star will win in the competitive set and provide advantages over your competition because you have a better line of sight on your consumer and what their desires are. Challenge your brands, become the thought leader. They're providing new information, they're communicating new information, they're innovating their products, but they're doing it always with a consumer focus. They want to be the ones that people are looking to when they want to know how to buy whatever category they're in. They want to have that trust in the innovation and never sit back and say, we have a God-given right to their business. A symbol of re-evaluation. Obviously, making sure the consumers know, your consumers know, that change is available to them, that there's a new energy, a new way of doing things, and that you respect their time and you respect their intelligence, and you respect their loyalty. Challenger brands also overcommit. It's simple. It's hard work today. A lot of my colleagues who are marketing people constantly are saying, oh my god, I can't believe this. There's a new technology. There's a new data gathering system. There's a new measurement tool. There's new mobile devices. What do we do? How do we do it? I look at it, and I hope that everybody in this room does the same thing. I look at it and say, no, we are in a time of unbelievable access to the consumer. Real time, we know what they're going through. Real time, we know what they're looking at. Real time, we know how much time they're spending with us. Real time, we know what they're doing. Now that could be intimidating, that could be a lot of work, or it also can be the richness of knowledge if we figure out what to do with it. So over committing to the consumer, over committing to consumer service, over committing to being there in good times or in bad are very important today. Challenger brands also enter the pop culture. It's not just good enough to throw out ads and expect them to, to work today. It's the dialogue you have with people. It's the experiential things you do with the consumer. It's creating a community that they want to be involved in, where they choose you. We talk a lot about things like opting in on email. They need to opt in on your brand. The world is not simple anymore where we can just expect that we're the only ones offering them something. Every competitive arena, every competitive business has multiple options. You need to earn it, and the way we, one of the ways we can earn it is by acting like a challenger brand and providing them an experience, providing them a community, providing them pop culture that you uniquely rise to the top of. Be idea-centered. Challenger brand maintains its momentum, it keeps it going, both what's perceived and what's real, but instead of just looking for that next idea, they center on what they stand for and they work it, and they work it, and they make sure that their consumer understands it because it's back to that transparency, that clarity, all the other things that make them straight. You know, one of the things that people ask me a lot is I come from Toys R Us, which was clearly a legacy brand, 
And they say, well, you know, in this world of all these startups and all this new technology and everything you've just been talking about, can legacy brands survive? And I, don't, I not only believe they can survive, I believe they can thrive, but they have to act like a challenger brand. What better option do you have than having size, substance, history, awareness, and attitude? Where a lot fall is they don't have that attitude of wanting to come out and win the battle every day and win the consumer. So legacy brands can compete if they make an emotional connection with the consumer. If it's just, well, we've been around forever, so you're going to buy from us, now they're in trouble. Short that stock quick. But if they're able to find a new way to re reinvent themselves with the consumer, make that emotional connection, they can win. They need to realize it's about entertaining, it's about being entertaining, empowering, and also making sure that you're engaging with the consumer. It's about success, celebrating your successes, which we all do pretty much as human beings. But I think you learn more from your failures. And I think that you need to have teams in your company that don't have to fear making a mistake. Because if they fear making a mistake, they will never try hard enough. One of the things that I always tell our teams is go for it. Be, first of all, be 80% right. If you're fixated on being 100% right, you're not ever going to make a decision. And two, when you're in that 20% where you're in trouble, throw up a flag and let us come in and help you. But don't be catatonic about making a decision because you have to move fast and you have to be 80% right. Don't be irrelevant and forgettable. Don't do advertising just for the sake of advertising. Don't send out messages. I was asked earlier today what I thought about um, email and what the future of it is. And I said if it evolves beyond spam, it's a very important way to communicate with people when they want to hear from you. If you're sending them messages that they don't want too often, they're going to cut you off. So I think that's on email, but it's also on a lot of other things. Don't be irrelevant, don't be forgettable, be there. Never fear change, no surprise that I feel that way because I think today's world is evolving constantly and as brands, just like us as people, we've got to evolve and if you fear changing things, what if I do this, is it gonna work, is it gonna put anything in jeopardy, you'll never do anything again. But today's world allows us to test and learn like never before. You don't have to make the full-on bet of the entire business, the entire plan, the entire marketing program. You can test and learn in small segments. That's where technology comes to heart. But you can't fear that technology. You can't fear change. You need to ensure that leadership embraces the future and isn't fixated on the past. Those people who are sitting in a boardroom saying, we're going to be there, we're number one, the competition can't catch us, the consumer's always going to shop with us, they have no option, we know how they want to shop they're vulnerable to competitive assault. And trust me, there are a ton of people that, as you guys know, sitting in Silicon Valley, in New York City, in Tel Aviv, Israel, who are doing nothing then looking for businesses that do exactly that, that lose sight of their consumer. And they will come in and they will disrupt. But I think legacy brands should be there ahead of them, because who knows more about their consumer than the people that are dealing with them today. New thought leaders. Bring in young people. It's amazing to me, you know, it's, at Serta Simmons, we recently acquired Tuft & Needle. Tuft & Needle was started five years ago by two guys who were Penn State graduate program programmers together, looked at the mattress business, and they were the first ones to say, this is an awful buying experience. They started a company with $6,000 and an idea that people wanted simplicity and ease of purchase. Young people, who have a different perspective are important and they need to not have to wait 15 years in the organization. I'm not advocating that they become the CEO or the CMO their first week on the job, but bringing in new talent, whether it's young or old, new, fresh ideas is critical to any legacy brand. Thought leaders, that's what we need. We need people who are going to think through but always do it from a consumer perspective. And fighting for the future without counting on the past to get you there, which I've talked about. Some final thoughts from me today. The best brand people realize that they have to get out of the way and make everything about the consumer. That goes back to my first day in the first meeting at Toys R Us. Everybody in that room would have said, I know how to run Toys R Us. I know what my customer's doing. We do $12 billion a year. We have number one market share. But none of them could get into the head of being a mom with kids. 
and I've dedicated my personal career, and every good marketing person I've ever met, you have to get that ability to focus on what the consumer is feeling, not what you're projecting them to do. And especially as every day, every week, every year goes by, that's exacerbated more and more. Consumers aren't being forced to do things anymore. They are voting, and they're voting with their loyalty. Consumer first, concept second. You can't create a concept and then go try and find customers. You gotta have the customer you want, the consumer you want, and then find a concept that appeals to them. Consumer insight, paramount. I mean, there's so much information out there, but it's not just the information. It's understanding what to do with it, with that reverse focus from the consumer out. About all about entertaining, engaging, empowering, which I've talked about, being brave is very important today. You have to change. You have to focus on the consumer. You have to let them know that you're prepared to do whatever it takes to be the place that they want to shop, whether that's online, in-store, or both. And frankly, that's an important part of it, too. People want to shop the way they want to shop. They don't want to shop the way you force them to. Surround yourself with passionate superstars. Anybody who doesn't want to be doing what they're doing today should not be doing it. It's as simple as that. Passion in the executive suite, passion in the marketing room, passion when you're going out as a supplier to retailers, to people who are printing, to people who are using your data. Passion in what you offer is contagious. And passion is also contagious to consumers. And by the way, when they get passionate about you, you've won. You just have to keep earning that trust. A good friend of mine, when he first said this to me, I had no idea what he was talking about. He's a, a German who speaks broken English, and he said, and Warren, remember, don't try and boil the ocean. And I'm like, okay, I must have lost something in that translation. And then I was driving home, and I thought to myself, there's brilliance in that. You can't boil an ocean. You can't change it all at once. You can do it a pot at a time. Maybe someday you can do it a pond at a time. You have to have a really good heater to do that. But you can't do it all at once. You can't change the world. You've got to work hard at it. So don't try and boil the ocean. Boil the things that you can boil and get them to change, and then more and more will start to work better. Be humble. A lot of brands aren't humble. A lot of brands are hungry. A lot of brands aren't humble. The best marketing people, the best brand people, the best business people have a really amazing combination of humility, because they don't think they're just going to get it by showing up to work in the morning. And also, a hunger to be the best in their business and to have and be number one. Humble and hungry is something that I wish for everybody in this room, and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Let's give another big round of applause to Warren. Um, you know what? I could stand here and yell like I always do, but I thought that, <laughs> thank you, uh, but I thought that some of the pieces that he said were so poignant for where we are today in a world of constant consumer change. Again, I spent my entire career at the world's largest companies fighting the battle of how do we move. I'll never forget, I uh, went into the boardroom, I tried to buy Nature Box before Dollar Shave Club was bought. I went into the boardroom and I, uh, I presented Nature Box. I thought we were going to get it. I was so excited about it. And then the board basically laughed at me and said we would never pay that multiple. And what I was saying is, look, we need those 12 million names to build a DTC business so we can compete with the guys that are nipping at our heels now but are being cutting off our ankles very soon. So then I left and about two months later, Dollar Shave Club was bought. So I sent the note to the entire board. I guess somebody would pay those multiples. But that's the thing is that many organizations are still stuck in a place where it's not even just, it's fear, as was said here. But I think one of the most interesting things here was they don't even really know. They spend so much time with inside the four walls of their organization. I used to be told, if you're not inside these four walls, you're not working. But the reality is, is if I'm not outside these four walls, that's where the consumer is. If I'm in here, then I'm, I'm actually not working. <laughs> I'm not doing a good job for you because the consumer is here. Or I used to hear, we want to do what's right for the business. Okay. But what's right for the business is to do absolutely nothing and continue to hope the 
you know, the world doesn't change and we can continue to be successful. But instead, maybe we should do what's right for the consumer. And if we move where the consumer is and in those deltas where the consumer changes, that's where growth is found. And that's what these guys, that's why startups have been able to win because they found the deltas at which are changed. And if you actually look at the 1950s, if I told you to advertise on television, you say, no, radio works well for me, I don't need your stinky television. But three bold brands, P&G, Unilever, and Kraft decided to invest because what they saw was that consumer consumption of TV began to eclipse where investment was. And in that delta, they built 60 years of competitive advantage. And so that's what we have to think about is how do we identify the deltas of where consumers change in order to create growth for ourselves and our organizations. Anyway, sorry, I'm not going to stand up here and preach. I usually do that for an hour. Uh, so, look, ladies and gentlemen, I stand between you and alcohol, and I hate doing that, as many of you found out the other night. So there is a networking reception this evening at Hakkasan Nightclub right here in the MGM Grand. You won't want to miss it. DJ Souza, who will rock the house. So get there at 6.30 to get your drink tokens. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. It's going to be an amazing time. And thank you, everybody, and enjoy.